Good morning, everyone. God bless you this day which the Lord hath made. Let us be glad and rejoice that the cup of communion within us may exert its efforts, the arrows of our heart may fly toward the abode of God, and that we may feel the return currents of universal love. These are supposed to be acorn mics. Acorns can be pretty big, you know. Especially if they turn into great oaks. I would like to have you turn to number 86, please. The number is, I love you, St. Germain. Yes, you can get a great deal out of this number. It all depends upon how much you put into it, as it does in all cases. Because we must weave the currents, we must weave the conduit toward God. As we send up the vibrations of our love, this provides the highway on which God's love returns. Some people say, does he need the highway? Perhaps not. But nevertheless, it still helps because it puts you in tune with the divine frequencies. The divine frequencies are not involved with your station in life. They are not concerned with how much money you have in the bank. They are not concerned with what university you graduated from or what one you didn't graduate from. They are not concerned with your neighbor's status or opinion of you. And frankly, they are not concerned even with your opinion of yourself, not in reality. These things are meaningless to the masters. They disregard political affiliations. And strangely enough, while they do not approve of smoking, they send their love and vibrations to people with pipes in their mouth just as well as they do with people that don't have pipes in their mouth. The point I'm making is that you cannot judge by external means whom God loves because God loves all people. And it is through the power of love that we really will begin to rise. If today you were told that your disease was fatal and incurable, that there would be no hope that you would see tomorrow's sunrise because it would be over very quickly, you might feel quite different about many things because our worldly set of values are based upon status in human eyes. But now if we forget human eyes, human opinions, and what people are going to say about us, and you begin to think what it is that your creator is going to think about the fragrance or lack of fragrance in your life, whether or not you are a contributing identity to the universe, whether you are giving something to someone that is of worth and of value, then you see you will change your opinion of yourself. Because you have to stand in a naked reality before God, not clothed with garments that you choose to weave of perhaps even illusion or maya of yourself. You say, this is what I am. But what are you really? Ask yourself what you really are. And you must find that you are God's child, first of all. As God's child, you then are entitled to an entirely different treatment than if you were some form of robot creation, a creation that had no identity, no meshing with the universe. You have an identity with the universe. 
you have an identity with God simply because you have not realized that identity, although you may have realized it in some lesser or greater degree. Simply because you have not realized it in its total degree indicates that there is more for you to receive. And this really will make a difference. One of the statements that Paul made, you know, the Paul of Mars Hill, and we have stood now upon Mars Hill, and it was quite interesting. One of the statements that Paul made was, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, you see, he humbled himself. That's the point you have to recognize. Is the humility that is not nihilism, that is not self-effacing. You must not erase yourself from the screen or blackboard of life. You do not have to immolate yourself. You do not have to sacrifice yourself in that way. You have to be willing to do whatever the law requires. So many people do not understand that there must be an instrument of transfer on the pathway toward God. If we were, for example, to annihilate ourselves, to reach such a level of humility that we did not even feel worthy to raise our head, we could not effect a transfer of divine grace to ourselves. Do you understand? It is necessary then that people do not completely destroy their personality in seeking God, but rather understand that it will be alchemically transmuted according to God's will. It is also a great mistake not to be willing to transmute it. Do you understand? So we are getting ready to sing to St. Germain and to our beloved Jesus also. Because, you know, one of the big problems that occurred throughout the years has been the jockeying of individuals for position. But what am I really talking about? The jockeying of people for position. Do you know when this occurred? When the Zebedee son's mother first came to Jesus and said, now I want my two sons to sit on your right hand and your left hand. And Jesus answered and said, This is not mine to give. And so we understand that it is very human for people to think in terms of the masters from the human level. As though if, for example, Jesus was speaking today as he is and so before we had Jesus' speech, his dictation, we would sing to St. Germain as we're going to do and someone would say, well now isn't that awful? That's terrible. We should honor Jesus. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. Well what would you think if we honored you? What would you think if we took any one of you, that individual, and then we sang to you, I love you, and then your name, before Jesus' dictation. You see, in the eyes of God, this would be just as valid. Because when the Lord God created man, he made him in his own image. The fact that the lambs have strayed from the fold, the fact that error has entered in, only pinpoints in a larger degree the great human need to have more of the saving grace of the Holy Spirit, of the divinity of God. We need more of it because people have strayed. 
No, Jesus is not interested in just being honored by our lips, nor are any of the masters. What really is taking place when we honor them is that we are tying into their vibrational frequency. We are plugging into the giant switchboard of the master and the dynamo of their power comes in then to us helping to change, to transmute, and to produce a valid experience, a genuine Christ experience, which will be something that you can hang on to when the whole world is shaking and quaking, when the world is struggling and erupting, no matter what happens, in a crowd or out of a crowd, you can still hang on to God. Yes, I'm the man, and I'm going to confess it to you. I'm the man that came out of the night many, many years ago during a thunderstorm in the snow area. When a barn was blown down and bawling cattle had their very innards hanging out the back end of the cattle, and they were crushed and bleeding and suffering, and milling farmers stood around and no one knew what to do. And so I came in out of the storm, stopped my car in my business suit, and ran over to them and took command of the whole project, and within 20 minutes all of the cattle were free. And then the stranger disappeared. A very minute thing. I'm the man who stopped the riot in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, when Thousands of people were pressing into a store because a radio cowboy had promised that he would give away absolutely free a $5 toy. All you had to do is be there. And then when they had about 25 toys left, they announced it from the platform accidentally. And so the crowd began crushing the little children. And the whole store was a pandemonium of horror. So I stood up and I screamed. I screamed at that occasion. And I took command of the situation in God's name and stopped the people and stopped the whole riot. Well, you can do all kinds of things like that. Anyone can do it. But this is something that the brotherhood has to be willing to do. You have to keep your head when everybody around you is losing theirs. Yes, I lost my head just a little bit at Air France on the way to the Holy Land this time. And I think you'll understand why. Do you know what happened? Well, the French are prompt. When they say they're flying out at 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock, they fly out at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock. The English are a bit different. You've heard it the other way. But at least in my own experience, it's been the opposite way. The French were very prompt. And so about a hundred people arrived at the airport with our group ready to go to the Holy Land. What do you think happened? There were probably 200 other people there going also, about 300 people to load on that plane, close to 300. And so all at once, I was suddenly informed that if I did not have all of my people's luggage on board that plane within half an hour, that they could not fly. None of you people knew this. But they said that if they were not on that plane in one half hour, that was it. They'd have to stay off the plane and follow the next day. So there I was in the middle of the terminal. Yes, I can be heard. But when you get 300 people all gobbling like geese, it's rather hard to hear. So I asked for the microphone. And I would have asked for a bullwhip, I guess, if nothing else, because I was just about in that frame of mind. I was desperate because the people had come and they were tired and they wanted to get on that plane. So I called upon my presence and I got up there almost like Jesus had to do when he drove the money changers out of the temple. Only in this case, I guess we were driving him in. But in any case, we got all the people on board the plane. 
And one person became angry with me, and they've never forgiven me because I raised my voice. All the rest of the people forgave me. But I'm going to tell you a little secret. I couldn't possibly have been hurt if I would not have raised my voice, and I was not angry as much as I was determined. <laughs> and if you were in a similar situation like this, you might just do it. Personally, I don't really like that kind of a job. I didn't like going into this tremendous storm and with all these very capable farmers who had no sense of organization because they were stunned, bless their hearts. I didn't like going in there. I'm sure they had as much knowledge as I did. But I took the direction because it needed to be taken. And we only shot two of them. We saved all the rest of the cattle. But the point is... In life, we have to be ready to be the instrument of God wherever we are and to do whatever is necessary. I may tell you before this class is over an activity that I took for the Great White Brotherhood where I was sent into a tavern many years ago in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I saved the lives of many people by being in that tavern. Yes, I drank a glass of beer on that occasion. Now, if you don't wish to speak to me again, go right ahead. <laughs> You've heard that old saying. They say that I... Uh, something about... Uh, I neither drink, smoke, or chew, and seldom speak to those who do. <laughs> but anyway, in life, the brotherhood is not always so sanctimonious that it does not dip into the cup of life to perform whatever task is at hand. Sometimes K-17's operators are laying under boxcars with binoculars for sometimes 24 hours in the cold. You have no idea. There is an activity that goes on in the universe of divine spying. We have to sometimes keep track of little events here and there. And if we didn't keep track of little events here and there, I'm afraid the earth would wobble off its axis. Now, I know that's a bit enigmatic, but I trust that you will understand it anyway. And if you don't, just throw it in your cornucopia of unsolved mysteries. Someday it will solve itself. Yes, I love you, St. Germain. We're going to sing to St. Germain, and I don't think Jesus is going to get very upset. In fact, I have never found that when we sing any song to any of the masters, that it upsets the masters. And I have never particularly found, if we give love to someone down here, that this upsets the masters. It doesn't. Because we are a part of divine love, and we need to be real people. It's very disgusting that people seem to feel the need to be artificial people. Well, if you've been an artificial person, as I'm sure at some time I must have been, then uh, you don't have to tell me about it. Just sort of take those garments of artificiality and shake them a little bit and get the dust out of them and then uh, dispose of them in the violet flame. I won't tell if you don't. You understand what I mean, don't you? I mean that in the world there's all kinds of artificiality. In fact, there are artificialities that are based entirely on fear. I have a person on my kitchen staff who is probably the most saintly person you'll ever meet in your life if you were to meet them. But they're scared stiff of people. And so because they're scared of people, they sometimes appear very aloof, this person. But I don't suspect that if I tried for 20 years, I could ever change them. I have hope that God can. But you see, sometimes try as hard as we can. We're not always able to change people. Primarily, I think, because they do not understand themselves. They live too close to themselves without being able to hold the objectivity 
that stands out in space and takes a good look at themselves. If you are frightened of anything, cease to be. There is no need of fear. If the other fellow is bigger than you and more skillful and might beat you up, well, just because you're scared is not going to help you. You're going to need all your faculties if you're going to do battle with them. Do you see what I mean? So it doesn't matter what the situation that you face. There's no use in being scared. You're never going to get out of this world alive anyway. <laughs> but spiritually, you will. Because you cannot be killed. You cannot kill God. So identify with God. Just decide that you're going to keep identifying. You know, it's a case of marbles. It's a marble game. You have two bags of marbles. And this sack over here is rather empty. This is God's sack. And so as you start to play the game, you begin winning for God, and you put a marble in the sack that's God's sack, and you keep putting them in there, and after a while there's no marbles at all left in your sack. And when all your marbles are in God's sack, then you see you can't die. In fact, nothing can happen to you at all because you've got all your marbles in God's bag. <laughs> now you can laugh if you want to. It happens to be 100% true. That's what it's all about. And when we've got a lot of our marbles over in our own bag, but a few in God's bag, then there's kind of a hassle back and forth, you know. Sometimes you begin to wonder who's winning. But after a while, you realize you don't care just so God wins. And when God wins, you will really be winning. You will have won. That's all of it. I love you, St. Germain, number 86. Let's stand. We pray that magic name brings to all the freedom's flame. Enables all mankind to claim like a Wednesday game. I love you, Saint Germain. I love your violent flame. I love your sacred name. You love it, Saint Germain. While you're standing, let's make a selection here. Demanding of God, yes, I said demanding of God, the blessing of the diamond heart. The diamond heart. Well, you say, yes, I recognize I have a heart, but what is a diamond heart? A diamond heart is both a diadem, a brilliant jewel, but also an instrument of necessary hardness. But not the hardness of heart that the ancient Pharaoh had, but the kind of a heart that God's way is hard. In other words, the kind of a heart that doesn't want to give in to human desires and frustrations, or limitations, or impositions, the kind of a heart that wants the will of God to prevail. And so it is a diamond heart, don't you understand? A diamond heart because it glows, it has fire, and it has the blue whiteness of the intensity of divine will within the heart. And you know, it casts out light rays, light rays of perfection and beauty to the world. And these are God's light rays, and they are Christed, and they help us to retain 
awareness of the will of God when all the world would seem to bend our will another way. O presence of the diamond heart, the melody drink to me only with thine eyes. In this case, the single eye vision is that which sees only the face of God, the divine potential in all that it does. As a man sees then, so he can become. You know what the scriptures say. It says, and when he shall appear, and when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Do you see what this means? We shall see him as he is. Well, we have so much anthropomorphism in the world, so much of individuals thinking according to their own idea what God is, that seldom do men perceive what God really is. O oh, presence of the diamond heart. Christ's devotion. Presence of the diamond heart within thy life we live. And as we walk along thy sway, thy blessing to all we give. Protection and peace and love sweet relief. blessing upon you please be seated you know beloved hearts of light this morning I want to tell you of a place in Cairo Egypt that we visited that in some ways almost reminds me of our focus here now this was the Coptic Cathedral where Mary the mother of Jesus appeared and has appeared to many, many people, visible not only from the sidewalks and in the joining neighborhood area, but visible also in the tremendous devotional aspect of the people. As we stood there then, 
that Sunday morning in Cairo with a brightly beaming sun. And as we witnessed the attitude of the people, we watched as the multitude, and there was indeed a multitude there, parted as we came in, permitting us ingress into the church. The priests were busy at their service of saying the Coptic Mass. But the devotion was so fervent that it was literally a physical flame as I see here today in the devotion of your hearts. But it was a flame of tangibility. It did not even need the utterance of words. And as I gazed upward at the great dome that was central to the cathedral, I observed that there they had a magnificent painting of Mary's head as I recall it, on that dome. And the whole cathedral, the whole purpose of their worship was to give glory to God and to recognize the immaculate concept, the immaculate heart, to try to bring to people an awareness of what God had wrought, what God had put within man. I am certain as I examine the auras of some of the close-by people that some of their lives were not all that pure. Yet, under the influence of the cathedral itself, they found the descending radiation from the Holy Mother, from the Immaculate Concept, from the Christ Consciousness, from the devotions in the hearts of the people, were actually raising them individually into new dimensions of consciousness and awareness. They were becoming familiarized with heavenly vibrations while still embodied here in the physical realm. Now at first, individuals may say, well, what is the value of all that? I don't see any specific value in familiarizing ourselves with heaven's vibrations. After all, we have quite a few years to live here on earth, and what do we need these vibrations for? Friend, you are putting your marbles in God's bag. That is exactly what you are doing. Because as you affinitize, and that word really should be a fine tide, as you are creating the finer and the more subtle ties between yourself and the divinity that actually is, whether mankind acknowledges it or not, then as you do this, do you understand that each such experience is the tuning of your frequencies to the divine wavelength? And don't you understand that the marbles love to run in the slots to which they are accustomed. And this is what a habit is. A bad habit is no different than a good habit. A bad habit is the mean laughter of our world, the coarseness and the grossness of our world. A good habit can be the, the brilliant, happy laughter in the Holy Spirit where individuals began to feel joy in seeing the faces of other people as they respond to the vibrations of God. When people begin to understand what it means to make others happy, not just to be made happy, but to make others happy. Try as we might here. Try as we might at La Tourelle. Try as most spiritual people, those of a spiritual mind, might try to do in all of their total exertions to please God, their willingness to please God. Do you understand that mistakes will be made? I learned recently, much to my sorrow, of a case where a family had asked their family to come to our headquarters. And then, due to an oversight and carelessness on someone's part, they were turned away. People are, are not always aware of why these things are. Sometimes we are in the middle of a very private dictation. Sometimes it is impossible to see people at a specific time. Try as we might. And so try as we might to please everyone. 
because we would never knowingly cast a stumbling block in any brother's pathway, in any sister's pathway. We will make mistakes simply because the large number of contacts that we have and the tremendous amount of business at headquarters is such that it's just impossible to always see everyone at the precise instant. I think that probably in this room we have a lot of people of goodwill. And I'm sure that drawn from the album of your own memory, you will realize that somewhere along the road of life you have tried very hard to please someone. It might even be a member of your own family. You wanted very bad to be kind to someone, or very happily, I should say. And the point is that somehow or other, no matter what you tried to do, it just didn't work out right. And so you were cut off from someone's friendship through no fault of your own. I merely mention this as it is a part of man's education, a part of our education in humility and being willing sometimes to bear the chastisement of someone's act that was not intended as an act at all, but was an oversight. If you will give the quality of forgiveness and mercy to others, you will receive it also from others. And above all, learn to have the presence of the diamond heart in your consciousness because the presence of the diamond heart is calm and determined to do the will of Christ without fanfare. We do not need a group of ten people before us sounding trumpets. We do not need to make long prayers in the mosques, the synagogues, the churches, the streets, or wherever we are in order to impress people with our spirituality. It is not important whether they recognize any value in us at all. For in the divine marks of God, what is important is the universal commodity of tangible divine love within the flame of our heart. However, we must be concerned and careful that we do not deliberately create problems for people. You know, I'll tell you something about the red flag. You know, the red flag is an anathema to the bull. And the bullfighters come out in the ring and they wave the red flag and the bull charges. And all over the streets of life, you are going to find people just like that. They are not all in our activity. They may be in some other church. They may be genuine spiritual people. They may have a good heart. But sometimes, practically everybody in this world have their pet peeves, their little anathemas, things that are somehow or other important to them. And so you don't go out and wave your red flag at those people deliberately, do you? No, 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 you don't. But if sometime you happen to do it and you get a reaction, try to understand. Try to understand that these things are natural and human. We are not all in heaven yet. We are not all perfected yet in the eyes of the world. And then if we were perfected in the eyes of one individual, we might not be perfected in the eyes of another. Because standards of perfection differ. Some people say, well, they would never have done that if they had been spiritual. Or someone will say, he or she would never have done that if they had been spiritual. Who is to say? I read a very interesting passage in the Old Testament. And while I heartily agree with the New Testament, I also agree with the rich lore of spirituality to be found in the Old Testament too. And so we read the story of the Ark of God and its journey under Mosaic law along the rugged mountains and how on one specific occasion, of course, a certain individual perceived the ark of God, this precious instrument to the Hebrew people, traversing the mountains. And as it was going along the mountains, suddenly the ark lurched. The individual knew the law well enough to know that it clearly stated, thou shalt not place thy hand upon the ark of God, this being reserved solely for the priests and for the Levites. But what happened? What happened? The individual rushed forward to save the ark from almost certain upset where it would have dashed down into the mountains, supposedly, 
and have been no more. And placing his hand upon the ark of God, what then happened? But the lightning and fire from within the ark came through his body and immediately he fell dead. The scriptures record that he was struck dead by God for a violation of the law. Those were austere moments, I am sure, because the purpose of the man was to save the ark. And so it is in many cases with the lives of many of you. Individuals think to save you from some danger, from some dire calamity, something that might happen to you that would be a tragedy. And so they place their hand upon your ark. They do this to the messengers. They do it to many people. And why do they do it? Because they are not aware of the law that applies to your life. And what is that law? The law clearly states, to his own master he stands or he falls. For God is able to hold him up. Therefore, it is a great danger sometimes to be too specific where you are not being consulted or to decide that someone has made a mistake. The world is full of mistakes, but it also has many right things that have been done in the world. And I feel very certain that the lives of all people are filled with many right things. They must have done some right things or they wouldn't be alive. Because there are many things that we can do to violate the moral codes, the chemical codes the different codes of life that would somehow or other defeat our reason for living. So we should understand that it is not our duty to chastise our neighbors or to decide that our neighbors are in some way departing either from tradition or from reality. I believe that prayer to God is valid. I do not believe that the man that was struck dead would have been wrong to have prayed that the ark come through safely. But I do not believe we need to interfere with those who have a master or are under the direct counsel of the masters. For here, where the counsel of the masters is disseminated, where attunement is practiced and fulfilled in due course of time, I believe that God is able as a living conscience within ourselves to dictate the tightrope upon which we should walk. Therefore, what we do is proclaim from the housetops the realities of God, the unlimited nature of God within ourselves, the capacity of God to take care of our problems, to watch over us, and to keep our attunement with him. Other than that, we do not believe in the folly of proscribing the instrumentation of an individual's life to say to him, thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. For each of us today does not have our teachers removed into a corner anymore. But we are able, in effect, to see our teachers through seeing what they do and the effect of what they do. We gaze upon the life of all individuals. We cannot help it. This is nature. We look with our outer orbs of vision upon people and we fit the format of individuals that we meet into the matrices that other people resemble in times past. And so through some criteria, either phony or real, we imagine that we have summoned an image of one another when oftentimes it is a pseudo image. It is lacking in dimension and color. It is lacking in gradation and reality. It is a freak image which in no way resembles the real certainly not the divine image that God created man in. By holding such an image, we often create a matrix of inducement. Now you may say, what do you mean? 
I am speaking about a matrix of inducement. In other words, a force that will attempt to coerce people to do the very specific thing which others think they will do. Or, in other words, to make it very simple as though you were thieves of Baghdad, I will say to you that someone says, well, these are thieves of Baghdad. I don't dare to lay my purse down because one of these people will surely grab it and extract whatever dollars I brought with me from my purse. If you hold such a concept of people and that individual had any propensity whatsoever to thievery, I can assure you that your thought of him would have a tendency to awaken even a latent image in many cases in him so that you might produce the strange phenomena of kleptomania quite suddenly. The point I'm trying to make is that people are themselves subject to various forms of hypnotic control. And these controls are very common in the marketplaces of life. And so I often think that people are induced to do things they would never do simply because wrong thoughts are held for them by the sanctimonious and holier-than-thou individuals who would never do any of these things themselves, yet seem perfectly willing to entertain the idea that others might. I want you to understand that there is nothing finer than the attitude of holding the immaculate, divine, diamond-hearted concept of people. Consider the lilies of the field, the Master said. Yes, consider the lilies of the field. Consider people as though they were lilies of the field, as though they were arrayed with the perfection of God already, as though they had love and purity and good motives in their heart and help them thusly to be able to outpicture this attitude in all that they do. I cannot tell you strongly enough what a negative matrix is how negative thoughts of people have a tendency to pull them down from heights, whereas in reverse and contrarywise and against the idea of negativity is the great positive tides that run in the universe and they run strongly. But the sluice gates of mankind's own individual heart must be raised. You have to be ready to receive them. You have to a stand ready to have the divinity and the purity and the glory of God to flow through you because you want it to happen. If you don't want it to happen, it isn't going to happen in many cases. Oh yes, you will be affected partially by the momentum, by the positivity, by the right attitude of people. You're going to feel the flow, you'll feel it. Even here you're going to feel it. Even if you're very hard, you'll feel it. But that's not the point. If you come to it, to a point of where your heart is contrite and pliable and can be molded by divinity, then others around you also hold an immaculate concept of you. This is going to help you. But what after they're gone? You can't toast your shins on their fires then. Now you must toast them on your own fires. And so the process of putting the marbles in God's bag this is something you have to do. It's not something that you have to do because I want you to, because the great masters above want you to. It's something you have to do if you want to fulfill your destiny. Without it, you will definitely follow the patterns of mediocrity. You will make certain gains nominally, normally, in life. This is going to happen. It will happen no matter what you are. And when you come to die and depart this world, if you have consciousness at all at that moment and are given the gift of consciousness, if you're not in some kind of a stupor, you'll be able to evaluate your past life, the whole of this life, and you'll be able to say, well, I really have made some gains because frankly, I believe in the ascendancy of everybody. I believe everybody's rising in spite of the undulations of, of the sometimes predominant fall. I think from time to time people uh, predominate in their falls. In other words, they fall more than they rise. But still, when the end comes, 
there's enough big rises that take place toward the end that most of them see their mistakes, reckon with them, and finally make some form of assessment of what they have done. But I think that's a sad thing, don't you? I think it's an unnecessary thing. I don't think it has to happen. There isn't a single solitary reason why you cannot make changes in your consciousness. I'm going to tell you something about Jesus. Jesus was one of the wisest, if not the wisest individuals that ever lived upon this earth. His thought process, the way he thought, the way he was able to put things together, the way he was able to utilize the mystical powers in the universe and release his divinity into himself was fantastic. It was so fantastic that because we have seen it, we dare to hope for the manifestation in ourselves of, as he has said, greater things can ye do. He wasn't talking to me. He was talking to you as well as to me. He was talking to us all. Greater things shall ye do. And here we have people in this world wasting their time in hatred and discussions against other people instead of seeing the common wheel. And that's the meaning of common wealth, common wheel. Instead of thinking of the common wheel and the common shoulder of every individual to put that shoulder and not be afraid to put that shoulder on the common wheel and help the big lugubrious wheel to turn in space. Let's make it turn. Let's move the wheel of life by many hands that make light work. Grandmother was not ignorant. She was illumined in many of her platitudes because we need many hands, many hearts, and many minds working together with the one mind that will produce the miracle of all ages. The Summit Lighthouse has never been created just to create an organization. I will tell you truly that many times from a human standpoint, since we have formed the Summit Lighthouse, and I will tell you this honestly, and if you misquote me on this, God pity you, because it will be actually a very great sin. What I am saying then is this, that I have regretted many times the fact that I have created it from the human level. God created it from the divine level. Moria created it, but from the human level I had to execute the design. And I have regretted it sometimes when I see the problems and all of the struggles upon our life stream, we don't mind the sacrifice. Don't misunderstand me. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the misunderstandings of people who say, well, they created it in order to make money. Well, if I told you, and if I had our treasure stand up here and tell you if he were here today, I guess he's here, but... If we got all the books and brought them out, you'd see how very little money. Oh, there you are, right in the front row. But how very little money we have taken out of it and how much we have put into it. We've put into it a vast potential. Both Elizabeth and I in the business world would be in the upper brackets today if we chose to go into the business world. I was at one time a state sales manager for an organization, and I often made $1,000 in one night. I have worked for the Summit Lighthouse for a salary for many, many years up until this year that was only $200 or $50 a week. So I want you to understand that it has not been money that prompted us in our endeavors, but infinite love and the hope that we perceived in our heart, the hope that we perceived that the will of God could be fulfilled among men. We did not feel that the instrumentation of the Christian church was fulfilling its destiny. We were not enemies of the church. We were not enemies of any religion, but friends to all. But we did not feel that God was being given a fair chance in the lives of the people. And through our great desire, we drew and magnetized the ascended masters more and more to us as they drew us more and more to them. And this is their work, a work of deliverance a work of salvation, a work that God has wrought in this day. And we pay him allegiance and give him all the glory for every bit of that endeavor. 
Someone once came here and said, after looking at our chandeliers, this was a minister from another church. He came here and looked at our chandeliers. I invited him to dinner. He had dinner with me. And after he left, he said, you can see that that man is purely mercenary. Well, I don't know where he saw it, in the, the crystals of the chandeliers or what. But my knowledge of St. Germain through the years has been that it is possible for the masters to appear in a humble cradle in a cave or a manger anywhere. They can live in the straw, and I have also lived in the straw, believe it or not, in this life. But the point I want to make is this, that St. Germain, who himself, was very instrumental in many of the constructive endeavors of Louis XIV during the golden age of Louis XIV, also created the great matrixes of uh, Versailles. And Versailles today remains one of the wonders of the world. After all, is it wrong, seeing that all things come from God, to deny God the right to be able to create a golden age culture for a people? And do we not expect that a golden age culture will once again come to our hearts and minds? We do not look down on anyone because of dress. We do not look down on anyone because of opulence. Both opulence and poverty are permitted under God. We can accept the vow of chastity and poverty and obedience if we wish, this is fine. Or we can accept the family father responsibility and choose to endow our youth with a culture which is divine. We can be what we want to be because God wills it so in us if we will accept that will. The main thing is, let not him that eateth condemn him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not condemn him that eateth. This St. Paul referred to as concerning vegetarianism. This is why, even today, we have some members who smoke. They don't smoke in the sanctuary. We don't say they have to get out. We don't demand that they give up smoking. We just don't want them smoking opium. But the point I'm trying to make is, while we, we get many people off of cigarettes, and away from many undesirable conditions. We do not tell our members what to do with their lives. We try to bring them into a place where the fires of God can touch their mind and touch their heart, and the cup of living fire is running over within them. And then they make their own decisions. And most of the time, strangely enough, after the passage of a little time, we see they all begin to rise into line, not to fall into line, but to rise into the line of perfection that, as Longfellow said a long time ago, arose in the Pukwana of the peace pipe. And so the beauty and perfection of the eternal cloud of knowing, the eternal cloud of knowing God, this is not obscurity but contact with light. And so all of us can, if we will, be instruments in the hands of God. Pliability is needed, and caution, of course. We do not urge that people believe everything that anyone say. We do not ask everyone to believe what we say. If they cannot prove it within their lives, then it is invalid momentarily. But it need not be declared invalid. It can be placed upon the shelf, volumes to be taken down when the mind is more capable of examining it with a more critical view. Not the type of critical view that criticizes, but the critique of divine reason. We want you then to understand that there is hope and hope and hope in this world. Hope for the ages and hope for our age. Hope for you individually and potential unlimited. If you will realize this in part today, it will help to make this conference a momentous occasion when you came at last to suddenly discover that there were plugs inside of you that were connected with God. And so you started plugging in, perhaps one at a time. 
Don't plug them all in at once. You might blow a fuse. But anyway, God bless you this morning. We are here, ready for the dictation of Jesus soon, and we will turn the meeting over to Mrs. Prophet.